All right, so we're going to read, uh, we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 9 is going to be our text that we're going to draw from this morning. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Father, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, once again, we come to you in prayer this morning, Lord. We thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to, to be able to present the message that I believe that you put on my heart. Lord, it's got a lot of scripture in it. It's got a lot of probably opportunities for teaching, Lord. But I pray that you would find the proper mixture of preaching and teaching, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you'd make your word exciting and real this morning. I pray that you'd penetrate the hearts of your people, Lord. That you'd drive your seed deep down on the inside of our spirit, Lord. That it would take root, Lord. That you would do what only you can do, Lord. I pray that you would use me as a vessel, Lord God. That you'd Fill me up and speak through me, Lord. I pray that you'd move me out the way. Move my flesh out the way. Move Matt out the way, Lord God. And let your word preach, Lord God. Let your word come forth and bring life, Lord God. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We give you glory and honor this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this letter, uh, Peter writes this letter to remind the readers, whoever they may be, that, that in this world, this world is full of temptation, is full of sinfulness. There's a lot of things that can get in the way, that can begin to draw people away from the truth of God and from what God has planned. Amen. And uh, really, I, I titled this morning's message, Nearsightedness. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but I talked about, I titled this morning's message, Nearsightedness. Uh, there's a danger in becoming blind when you see all of the things around you, when you see the sinfulness that's around you, when, you're, when you begin to be drawn upon by the lusts of the world, that it can cause you to become nearsighted. What does that mean? That you become focused on the here and now, and that you become focused on your own life, and that you, that in Instead of being able to see in the future, being able to see a little further off, being able to, to remember that God has certain promises, you begin to live your life uh, by, by, by what you're experiencing in the here and now and by that which is very close to you, if that makes sense. And, and, and these things that are out there can cause people to fall away from the truth. So the, he doesn't want them to become nearsighted, and he, and he wants them to be able to be reminded of the inheritance of eternity and the return of the Lord. There's promises that are given to God's people. i got to remind you of that. That's what the gospel says. The gospel says there is an inheritance of eternity and that the Lord's going to return. I don't know if you believe that or not. Amen. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know if everybody in this room believes what I'm saying. I'm telling you that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that true believers have an inheritance in eternity. That means that when you go to sleep on this earth, when your spirit leaves this mortal body, that that's just the beginning. Amen. That's not the end. That's just the beginning. 
And that, you know, I, I, I wrote this poem one time. I don't remember exactly how the poem goes, but I remember I stole this line. I didn't steal this line. I mean, anybody that read the book. I used a line out of this book called Jane Eyre. Who's ever heard of Jane Eyre? The only reason I read it was because I went to college. But I remember there was this one spot in Jane Eyre. Man, I like that book. <laughs> you know, like maybe a little weird to the strong guy. But anyway, I like that book. Charlotte Bronte was her name, I believe. Yeah. She wrote that book back in the 1700s, 1800s. Anyway, there was this one little line where her aunt was dying in the bed and she said, whither wilt that spirit flit when at length released? I love that line, man. It just, it stuck with me. I wasn't even really a strong Christian at the time, but I love God. She was, it was old English and it was poetic, but what it was describing is where is her spirit going to go when her mortal body dies? Where is it going to flit to? Where is it going to go to? Will it go to heaven or will it go to what the Bible calls Hell. What I'm here to tell you this morning is that there is a spiritual eternity. There's an eternal inheritance for the child of God. That's what the Bible promises. And, and that the Lord is also returning. We have to be reminded of these things because if not, we can become nearsighted. We can become nearsighted and caught up in the corruption that is of the lust of this world. And we forget what lies ahead. And we become complacent. Some of the things P Peter mentions that are against uh, the readers in this letter, he mentions that we're going to go through some of them. He warns that there's false teachers. A lot of times people have wondered, why does the preacher always talk about false teachings and false gospel? Because it plagued the early church then, and it really plagues the, the church today. Amen. False teachers abound. A false gospel can destroy your faith. He reminds them of the disobedient angels that took place a long time ago and the effect that it had on the human beings then. I don't, that's another thing I don't know if everybody in here believes. There's a spiritual realm that you and I cannot see with our physical eyes. We cannot touch with our physical hands. But that spiritual realm made of fallen angels, demon spirits, and angelic hosts that belong to God affect the physical world that we live in. Affect our physical lives affect because they try to draw upon us negatively or in a good way regarding our actions and, and their attempt to cause us to go in a wrong way or a right way. I'm here to tell you, I don't know if you believe in the spiritual realm. A lot of times nowadays in the modern church, they don't talk much about the spiritual realm. Everything's all about practical stuff. Just about your finances, just about your family. Just But guess what? There's spiritual entities behind those things that are driving people to be destroyed. I just want to remind you of that. He reminds them that also there will be scoffers. You know what a scoffer is? That's that dude at work. <laughs> That's that dude at work and the one at school or the person that you run into that laughs when you talk about Jesus. And they may not laugh at you to your face, but they'll definitely laugh at you behind your back. They're the unbelievers, the people that think it's ridiculous, the things that you talk about regarding the things of God. In light of all this, it's extremely important that believers stay focused on the big picture and don't become blinded with nearsightedness. Let's look at a couple of these Passages of scripture that Peter uses that I just talked about. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is where he's talking about the false prophets. He says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, secretively, without you knowing it, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Basically what it's saying there is that there's going to be false teachers, false prophets that are going to preach a false gospel and that it's going to cause people that believe to follow their ways and that their faith of them will be destroyed. But not only that, it's also going to cause the way of truth to be spoken of in an evil way. That's why many times you see, don't get me wrong, you don't have to give too much fuel to the world to make fun and to scoff at the things of God anyway. But a lot of times you'll see people, if they've watched certain things on television, and they'll make fun of it. Why? Because a lot of that stuff on television isn't of the Lord. And they're scoffing and they're making fun of because it's ridiculous. And even the world can tell that most of that stuff's ridiculous. But yet, many of us in the church have been deceived by it. Lord knows I've been deceived by some of that stuff in the past. 
And so the, the Peter wants his readers to be aware. Listen, you got to be careful of these false prophets. Second Peter chapter two, verses four through six. First, he talks about false apostles. Now he's talking about these fallen angels. He said, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, he's talking about the angels that sinned in the Old Testament before the flood, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. There were sins in the Old Testament before the flood. I'm sorry, angels in the Old Testament before the flood that committed sins that caused some of those angels. It doesn't say specifically how many in the Bible that we read, but there was a, an extra book called the book of Enoch that says there were 200 of them. The Bible quotes Enoch, so I believe Enoch's a valid book, but I don't know for sure that there was 200. I'm just telling you there's another source that says there was 200 of them. The Bible, the Bible does teach that what these angels did was they commingled with the daughters of men. What does that mean? They had sexual relationships with human women. Now, they won't teach you that in Bible college because they teach it something else. But I'm here to tell you that's what the Bible teaches. And I don't have time to get into it all. We've taught it in detail on multiple occasions. How does it happen? Don't ask me. I don't know how an angel has sex with a woman. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible teaches that it happened and that it produced, it produced giants in the land. And now we see in the, before the flood wickedness on the earth. At a level that you and I don't even understand. Listen, I, I've watched these videos that y you can uh, uh, Good Fight Good Fight Ministries puts out, and um, you know they got this one on that girl Kesha. Not that I know I don't know much about Kesha. I know she spells her name with a little dollar sign. Um, <clears throat> but they did a 20 minute expose on her, and I mean, look, me and Robert watched that thing. That was some crazy stuff. Showed her getting initiated into the occult. I don't even know why I'm getting into all this. I'm just trying to make a point. Showed her getting initiated into them. They had footage of her drinking her own, well, I'm just going to say her own urine in this van because it was part of her initiation. But what I wanted to tell you was, was that they had video of her on a radio show and they were talking to her and she talked about a demonic entity that followed her around from hotel to hotel that she was having relationships with. What I want you to know is, is that you don't even know what you're being influenced by. You, th you can think I'm crazy. The people on the video can think I'm crazy. I'm here to tell you that there's a spiritual world and we're over here listening sometimes to this worldly music that we think everything's perfectly okay okay with it. Oh, they're not saying all that bad of stuff. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that the genesis or the birth behind it is of another spirit. Amen. This spirit that was following her around, they're opening these musicians, open themselves up to these things in order to receive revelation to be used by them. Yeah, they're using it for fortune and fame and power and money to drive these big cars and have big houses and to live for the nearsightedness that's right there around them, but they're being used for a bigger purpose. To destroy and to corrupt the mind, the heart, and to move it away from the things of God. I'm here to tell you, I believe that with all of my heart. What I'm trying to say is, is that these fallen angels in the past that was going on then, stuff like that in some way, shape, or form still goes on today. There's wickedness that abounds. God did not spare those angels, but he put them in chains of darkness, awaiting the day of judgment. There's going to be a day of judgment that comes on the earth where these things will be released, okay? But it says right here, he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Basically, I just wanted to, to tell you that the, the result of these fallen angels and the effect that they had upon humanity caused a wickedness to take place that caused the destruction and judgment of the world of that time. So why did I even say all that? Because Peter's warning, don't forget about the demonic entities. Don't forget about the spiritual world. Don't forget that there's things on this earth that will try to pull you away from the things of God. Second Peter chapter three, verses one through four says this second epistle, beloved. I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were 
from the beginning of the creation. So you can see here, you got people in the church talking about the fact that Jesus is coming back. And if you ever really try to talk to people about the Lord, you'll see that there's going to be a lot of people that would make fun of that type of thing. Peter warns, hey, there's going to be scoffers in the last days. They're going to say, oh, when's he coming? They've been saying he's been coming since way back when, and he still hadn't come. Everything continues on the same. You know how short our life is? Our life is nothing but a little vapor. Listen, it goes on to say in 2 Peter 3, 8 through 10, it describes why this happens like this. He's, but Peter says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. God doesn't count, doesn't live according to a clock. He's not watching the second hand or the minute hand. He's not watching the hour hand. God does not live according to a clock. He's not on a time schedule. He does things the way he wants to do things. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. It's not like he's slow or he's lazy to accomplish what he said he would do. As some men count slackness, but he's long suffering. The reason that God hadn't showed up yet was because he'd been waiting for somebody like you to give your heart to Jesus. He'd been waiting for somebody like me, amen, to bow my knee to the Lord because he's merciful and he's long suffering and he doesn't want anybody to split hell wide open and die and go to a devil's hell. Many of us would send people to hell when we look at him and we judge him. That's not how God is. God's long suffering. He's merciful. Amen. Amen. He's loving and he's kind. And thank God that he is. Because if he wasn't, I'd be in a whole world of hurt. I don't know about you. To us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Amen. Even though he's long suffering, you need to know. Peter wants the people to know, listen, he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to be coming like a thief in the night. And when that happens, the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. The elements, that means everything that this earth is made of, are going to melt with fervent heat. It's going to, I don't know how you describe that, like volcanic lava. <laughs> and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The earth that we know today is going to be burned up with fire. Look at this, verse 2 Peter 3, 12 and 13. Looking for and hasting. <coughs> Unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Look at this, the promise of God. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Even though you're on this earth, and even though there's scoffers out there that are making fun of the things of God, and even though there's false prophets out there that are preaching false gospel, and even though there's fallen angels and demonic spirits that are trying to corrupt you and move, move your flesh towards the things of sin, you need to remember that even though this earth is going to burn up and people are thinking that it's not going to happen, the good news is, is that the child of God has a promise from God, and he awaits a new heaven and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. He's going to be an inheritor of eternal life. Amen. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and now. And forever. Amen. So all of this reminding the readers, listen, there's danger out there. Danger is right around you. It surrounds your immediate, uh, your immediate space. But you need to be able to see past the immediacy of where you are. You need to not be focused and, you know, so focused on what's going on. Allow yourself to be drawn away that you that you can't see a little further out, that you can't be reminded of the promises of God that lie down the road. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. I wanted to, that, that, that was basically my introduction. I just wanted to tell you why the letter was written. The letter was written for the people that were going to read it to be warned of the things that are out there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't want to make a big deal about this, but really that, tr that verse could have been translated through the righteousness of God, our Savior. This is one particular passage in the scripture in the Greek language that is, that is really descriptive of the fact that God, that Jesus is God. 
in the Greek language underlying the Greek language, the, the scripture is saying Jesus is God. Why is that important? Because there's a lot of false religions out there that don't believe that Jesus is God. All right. But anyway, this letter was written as a reminder, once again, to believers. I wanted you to see that. That word, that, that phrase right there, obtained like precious faith. It's like we often, I think that we often take for granted the fact that you and I, if, at least if we're believers in here, if we've been saved, I think that we take for granted the fact that we <clears throat> were exposed to the gospel and that by the grace of God, our heart responded by faith to the gospel and that by the grace of God, we were saved. If you've been saved, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't really been saved, maybe that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But Peter's writing. Those are his readers. That's who he's warning. Those who have obtained like precious faith. Amen. And, and the other thing I want you to see is, is that in that passage of Scripture where it says that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how we obtain this like precious faith, through his righteousness. Now, this is another passage of scripture where you don't see the word cross. You don't see the word blood. You don't see the word sacrifice. But nevertheless, the passage screams the sacrifice of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, according to the scripture, is the only righteous one. Jesus is the only righteous one. He's the only one that was born without sin. Mankind, according to the Bible's testimony, was born of Adam and he was born of sin. Therefore, man cannot see God. He cannot experience God. He cannot enter into God's presence. But if you've obtained like precious faith, the way that you did it was you became a recipient of the righteousness of Jesus. Now, that's really important. We need to slow down a little bit and we need to think about that for a second. That means that if you have not obtained like precious faith, that means that if you have not obtained the righteousness of Jesus through the transaction that took place at the cross, you can't get to heaven. There is no eternal inheritance for you. Oh, preacher, you're, you're, you're being exclusive. You're trying to say that only Christians are going to make it to heaven. Exactly right. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Only Christians are going to make it to heaven. And listen, and I'm not trying to pick on it. I don't know that we ought to even be clapping about that. I think what we ought to be doing is, is that it ought to be causing something to take place to our heart to cause us to come to the realization, this is why we have to evangelize. This isn't just some little story that we talk about. The Word of God says that God has a plan and that man was, because of his sinfulness, separated from the holiness of God. Therefore, God in his love and his mercy and his grace sent his son Jesus, the righteous one who was without sin, to pay a penalty on the cross. He took your sin. He took my sin upon him. He was judged for our sin. Somebody has to be judged for the sin according to the Word of God. The Word of God says all men are born sinful. Somebody has to pay the price. Amen. You can't pay the price. Amen. I'm not going to go through all the list of a bunch of different religions, but I do remember I took this foreign, this world religion class when I was in Bible college. And I had a conversation with a Muslim person about this one time. I didn't know how it was going to go, but I went for it. The Lord, the Lord led me, so I did it. I said to him, I said, listen, I said, so one of us is wrong. One of us is wrong here. You know that. I told us, I said, you know that one of us is wrong because we both can't be right. And he said, yeah, you're right. One of us is wrong. I said, the problem that I have is, see, there was this other writing called the Hadith that Muhammad wrote commentary about some of the scriptures in the Quran. And in the Hadith, Muhammad said this. He said, with one drop of the martyr's blood, all his sin is atoned. What Muhammad was saying is, is that the martyr, when he dies for the cause of Islam, his sin is atoned for because he gave his life for the faith of Islam. And I told the, the, the lady that I was talking to, I said, ma'am, the problem that we have with that is that the martyr's, sin is, the martyr's blood is tainted with sin. 
Your blood, according to the scripture, is tainted with sin. My blood is tainted with sin. I can't die for my own sin. Somebody that had no sin had to die for my sin. His name was Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the one that the Bible testifies was the plan of God from the beginning. It's not my fault that they also have a fallen angel named Satan that is into deceiving humanity and is a creator of false religion and is propagating a lie, false religion, false gospel out there and inundating the minds and causing deception and confusion in the minds of countless of millions of human beings through thousands of years of human history. It's not my fault that that has taken place, but that is what the Bible says, that there's a fallen angel named Satan, and that is exactly what he does. He does everything that he can. He's ruthless. He wants to destroy human souls, and he's been in that business for a long time, and he's really good at it. But I got good news. Those who have obtained light, precious faith. You know, one of the things that I did want to talk about, and I've talked about it before, and I want to say it again, is that what he's talking about here is a noun faith. And if you've heard me say this before, you know, look, don't, don't get bored with me. I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I want you to understand something, all right? If you've never seen it before, you know, you know what a noun is, right? A, a what? A person, place, or thing. Thank you, Ms. Bridget. A noun is a person, place, or thing. It's different than verb faith. What is verb? What is a verb? A, a, a verb is an action word. So how do you obtain light, precious faith? See, this faith right here is a noun faith. It's almost like if we, uh, well, I mean, I always describe it this way. Let's say the world's out there and the kingdom of God is in here. When I was out here and I gave my faith to Jesus, uh, when I put my faith in Jesus, I was in the world. But now I've been ushered into the light, precious faith. And now I'm in a place. This is a new place. It's called in the kingdom. It's the faith. It's the light, precious faith. Amen. And I put my verb faith, action, heard the gospel, and, re and, and believed by faith. You might not have been able to see it, but it was an action. Matt said yes to the gospel. And when he did... He was translated into the light, precious faith that Peter's talking about. You've obtained light, precious faith through the, through the righteousness of Jesus. I hope that makes sense. I hope it makes sense that that's why we have to evangelize the gospel. Some people wonder, why didn't people always want to tell people about Jesus? I'm going to tell you why. Because when they have truly obtained light, precious faith, and the gospel now resonates on the inside of their heart. And they've gotten a revelation that their sin was forgiven. They have to tell somebody about Amen. it. Doesn't matter whether you scoff. Doesn't matter whether you laugh. Somebody has to be told because we believe this gospel story. And you're not going to just get in on your good works. You're not going to get in on your good works. Listen, somebody's lying. If you could get in on your good works and doing good to people all of the time, then Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. That's right. One of them's not true. I'm sticking with Jesus. Amen. It makes sense. The word of God gives me an answer on why there's so much corruption on this earth. It makes sense that Matt can't do good enough in order to make things right. Amen. Jesus is the one that made things right. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. We're just going to go through a couple of these verses. We're still laying a little bit of a foundation here. Peter says, uh, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We have discussed many times the thoughts of grace and peace, how important they are to our walk with God. Amen. You know, the idea of grace, I've given this definition many times since I've started teaching or preaching the Bible. The definition of grace is that it's a, a divine influence on the heart. Divine, what does that mean? Uh, Supernatural, God. Influence on the heart. Is, is he talking about, you know, I think in Spanish you call it the, the corazón, right? Is he talking about that, that organ that pumps blood in your body? No. He's talking about the inner man. A godly influence on the inner man and its reflection in the life. Grace does an inside job that changes people outwardly. 
It becomes manifest in their outward life. You can't change yourself. You can go all the self-help groups you want to, and you might be able to fake it till you make it. But the truth of the matter is, is that if something's really going to be changed, it's going to be the grace of God that changes you on the inside. Hallelujah. And when the grace of God changes you on the inside, it becomes obvious because it's manifested outwardly. Amen. Grace and peace be unto you. When the grace of God hits you, then peace comes on the scene. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you right now, you can be in the midst of chaos, but when God's presence shows up, there's peace Amen. in the midst of chaos. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But nevertheless, that's why Paul can sit in a prison in Rome and write letters and use the word joy probably 15 times. <laughs> because the grace of God was there. The peace of God was there with him. Amen? But I wanted to focus a little bit on this one particular word, knowledge, right there. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. The word in the last verse said that, that we have obtained like precious faith through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the righteousness of Jesus. Now this is saying that we grace and peace are multiplied unto us through the knowledge of God. Now, this word knowledge is, is different than with just your regular knowledge. It, 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 you would spell it like this, epignosis. This word gnosis is where you get the word Gnosticism, and it just describes knowledge. Epi means upon, so you can write it up like that, upon knowledge. It means it's over and above knowledge. It means it's just not intellectual in nature. It's got a practical, experiential aspect to it. What are you trying to say, preacher? You're using a lot of big words. I'm trying to say this kind of knowledge is experiential. I'm trying to say that as you walk through life as a believer and you get this book out and you start to read about this book, you know, if you're going to learn about the word of God, you're not just going to be able to show up on Sunday. I, you know, I'm going to introduce you to a character named Joseph of Arimathea here in a little bit. And I'm going to talk to you about the fact that he was a Pharisee and none of that means anything to people that don't know what it means. The reason that I introduce you to characters in the Bible is because one day I want to just be able to talk about them. I just want to tell you, yeah, Joseph of Arimathea went and got the body of Jesus. And I want you to know who that is. But, if, but, but until I teach you who he is, you'll never know who he is. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that we got to crack the book open. Yeah. we got to crack the book open and we got to read. And not just anywhere, but we got to read from the beginning to the end. Why do I have to read when I can just come and hear the preacher preach? No, this is your lifeline to God. Amen. Amen. This is what God has left for you on this earth for you to be able to know him. You're not just going to be able to get the information from somebody else. Should you listen to preachers? Absolutely. Should you have fellowship with other Christians and talk about Jesus? Absolutely. All those things help expound and increase our understanding of God. But what I'm trying to say is this. I'm talking about knowledge right now, but I'm just saying it's not just intellectual. It's not only you opening this book, but it's you opening this book and then walking out there. Amen. Walking out there and experiencing life. Experiencing victories. Experiencing failures. Experiencing situations. And with all of that, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working together in combination, producing an experiential knowledge about the things of God. And as you, that experiential knowledge about the things of God increases in your heart and mind, the grace of God and the peace of God are able to flow into your life even more. Why? Because you better understand God you better understand how to access His grace. You better understand what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and what He did for you at the cross. So I just wanted you to see that, that, that in order to truly, that's how we have access to this peace and grace. Amen. Let's look at verse 3. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Look at that. I want you to just see a couple of that, that word knowledge is there again. It's his divine power. That's one of the things that we have to remember whenever we're walking with God or living for God and we find ourselves confronted by situations in everyday life and we don't feel like we have the strength to get out of the circumstance or whatever the case, it wasn't supposed to be your strength to begin with. Amen. It's His divine power. It's the Holy Spirit working through what Jesus did because 
you received his righteousness and now you've obtained like precious faith. You're now in the kingdom of God. You now have access to his grace. It's his power that's working in you. Amen. His power has given you all things that pertain unto this life and godliness. God wants to equip the believer in order that he might live out his life upon this earth in such a way that he does it in a godly fashion through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now, I just wanted to spend one moment on this because I want you to see that word given right there. There's a cool thing about that word that I never knew, and this is something that I learned, so I want to share it with you. This word given is only used three times in the New Testament. One, two times, and listen, a lot of people don't realize this too, but the Gospel of Mark, many people believe that it was actually Peter's account of the Gospel that Mark wrote when he was in close fellowship with Peter. So Mark is recounting Peter's experience of the Gospel and the connection that he had with Jesus. The interesting thing is that this Greek word is only used three times, two times in the letter, in this letter right here that Peter wrote, the other time in the Gospel of Mark. And you know when it's used in the Gospel of Mark is this, is that it's used to describe whenever Joseph of Arimathea went to get the body of Jesus. Who's Joseph of Arimathea? Well, that's why I got to talk to you a little bit about it. See, we got to slow down. We got to, we got to introduce you to a character of the Bible. Joseph of Arimathea at some point in time, definitely became friends with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is the guy in John chapter 3 that was a religious leader called a Pharisee. And I've talked to you about that before. Sadducees and Pharisees. We talk about that a lot, actually, right? Sadducees and Pharisees. This is like Sunday school in the middle of our message. We used to sing that song, and I know Bridget laughed about three weeks ago when I said it. I used to sing a song in, in, in Sunday school at the old church I got saved in. Christopher grew up on that song, probably. Uh, how does it, it go? Uh, I don't want to be a Sadducee, because Sadducees are Sadducees. And the reason that Sadducees were sad was because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They're the ones that tried to trip Jesus up whenever they said, Master, great rabbi, we knew a man who once had a wife, and uh, he... A woman who had a husband and he died and then she married his brother because the law said that she was supposed to marry his brother and he died and then she married another brother. He had seven brothers and all of them died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? They're just trying to trip up Jesus. Jesus says, you act for you know not the scriptures. Some people think that I've been mean as a preacher. No, Jesus told them, you act for you know not the scriptures. You think you know something, you're trying to trip me up, you don't even know what you're talking about. Because in the resurrection, we don't get married. Because we're like the angels. We don't become angels, but we receive a glorified body. And in the glorified body, according to the scriptures, we don't reproduce. She ain't going to be nobody's wife. She's going to be the wife. She's going to be my bride. That's who she's going to be. And, there's gonna, and it's a spiritual marriage. It's a spiritual relationship. It's a spiritual intimacy. And for those of you that that makes you sad that there won't be sex in heaven, you want to be worried about sex. You'll be so happy, amen, that you're connected to Jesus. You want to be thinking about that stuff. Amen? Amen? Praise God. I know it's hard for you to wrap your mind around that. But I'm here to tell you, that's how good it's going to be in heaven. Amen? Anyway, I'm talking about Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was one of these Pharisees. And him and Nicodemus, after Jesus died, went and asked Pontius Pilate for the body of Jesus. And the Bible says that Pilate gave him the body. The idea of this giving describes the precious value of the gift that's being given. It doesn't just describe the fact that a gift was given. It describes the fact that the gift was precious. The gift that was given was precious. And what this is saying is that His divine power has given us a precious gift. Amen? That you and I can have and be equipped with everything that we need yes. on this, in this life to live a godly life for the Lord. Amen? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Here it is again, that same word, the second time it's used in this letter. But whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now some of the promises we've already mentioned, Peter wrote about them in his first letter, the eternal inheritance, and the return of Jesus. 
But look at this. This precious promise also that we would be partakers of the divine nature. Because Christians are partakers of God's nature, they can share in his victory over sin. Amen. When you died, spiritually speaking, when you got saved, if you did really get saved, when you got saved, you became one with Jesus at the cross, meaning in the mind of God, you died with him. You became one with Jesus in the tomb, meaning in the mind of God, you were buried with him. And you became one with Jesus in his resurrection, meaning you resurrected to newness of life. When that happened, you now the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you and you became a partaker of the divine nature. I want to talk to you a little bit about a nature. Yeah, you know, I just started thinking, OK, well, what, what does the word nature mean? Well, nature describes things having to do with things like environment, appetite, behavior. It has to do with who you really are on the inside. I thought about these two animals and the nature of a pig and a lion. Now, I'm not trying to describe that a lion looks like a Christian and a pig looks like a sinner. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm just describing nature. So don't read more into it than what it is. The nature of a pig. <laughs> the nature of a pig, his environment where he lives is in a pig pen. Have you ever seen a pig pen? Pretty nasty, right? The nature of a lion is that he lives amongst other lions in something called a pride. A lion's pride. Also, the nature of certain things have a particular appetite. Pigs have an appetite for slop. You can just chunk a bucket of that stuff up in there and they, and they just are so happy about it. Lions have an appetite and are hungry for flesh. You can, you've seen the pictures before on television, the videos of the lion and after his hunt and how he's ripping the flesh apart. Also, nature has to do with behavior. Pigs could care less about anything but their slop. And just sitting there rooting around, <laughs> waiting for the next bucket to fall up in. That's why Jesus said this. Y'all think, I'm telling y'all, y'all think Jesus never told people that he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. That's some hardcore stuff right there. Well, what is he talking about? I'm going to tell you what he's talking about. You ever had a con tried to have a conversation with somebody about the Lord before and they would have rolled in their eyes while you're talking to them, turn their head, roll their eyes? I'm not trying to say that person's a pig. What I'm trying to say, though, right there at that moment in time, basically what you're doing is you're casting pearls before a swan. What does that mean? Because they could care less about the precious word of God that you're trying to give them. It's like a pearl. And if you threw a pearl up in a pig pen, that pig is going to he's going to stomp it into the slop as he snorts around smelling for some of that old corn mixture stuff, whatever it is that they call it. Corns and lima beans. That's what's going on. They don't have, that's the, that's the, that's the behavior of a pig. He doesn't care about it. That's his nature. That's what he's hungry for. Just give me some slop. I don't want no pearls. Lions are either, their, their behavior is they're either hunting, eating, or usually resting with their fat. I'm not saying they never play with their little cubs, but you know what I'm talking about. Usually for the most part, they're hunting, they're, they're, they're eating, or they're resting. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about, about the nature of a Christian. Christians also have an environment that they're supposed to live in. They're supposed to live in light. And not in darkness. Christians also have an appetite for certain things. They're supposed to be hungry for the word of God and the things of God. Christians have a certain behavior. They're supposed to be desiring for godliness and not wickedness. I guess, you know, one scripture that talks about that their environment, once again, should be light and not darkness. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? This is just gives you an example that an unbeliever is not supposed to be with hanging out with unbelievers. I'm not saying you don't work with unbelievers. I'm not saying you never went to school with unbelievers. What I'm saying is you're not supposed to be in close fellowship with unbelievers. <laughs> I've never watched it before, but I know on Netflix they got a series called Sons of Anarchy. I don't really know exactly what it's about, but I can just about imagine it's a 
story about a biker gang. They probably sell methamphetamine and kill a bunch of people. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that if you were a son of anarchy when you were born of Adam, after you've been born again, you ain't supposed to be a son of anarchy anymore. You're not supposed to be riding in the gang. I'm not saying you can't ride a motorcycle, but you ain't supposed to be riding in the gang with the sons of anarchy, slinging methamphetamine on the side of the road and killing folk. When I, the point that I'm trying to make is that when you get saved, you ain't supposed to be still in the same old place that you were always in. If you don't like that, then you don't like good preaching. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. You're not supposed to continue to live in the midst of darkness after the light has entered into your heart. You're not supposed to be still hungry for the things of the world after the light has entered into your heart. You're supposed to be hungry for the Word of God and the things of God. Right. And if you're not, then there's a problem. Yeah. Amen? Can we all say that? We know that sometimes we're drawn away. We know that sometimes the enemy tries to entice us to go towards something that we're not supposed to. But can we all at least agree that we agree that it ain't right? It ain't right to be a son of anarchy after you gave your heart to Jesus. It's not right to continue to live in darkness after you gave your heart to Jesus. It's not right to be hungry for slop after you gave your heart to Jesus. Amen? That's the nature. You've become a partaker of the divine Nature. Praise God. In the first four verses that we just discussed, what happens is, is that it's describing the fact of God equipping the believer. Supernaturally, through the conversion process, God has equipped the believer with a divine nature. The old man that was born of Adam died with Jesus. A new man born again of Jesus has received the divine nature. The Holy Spirit lives in him. He's empowered with divine power from God in order to be able to live for God upon this earth. Listen, before Jesus, the unsaved sinner is dead. I want to prove this to you according to the word of God, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We haven't even got to the good part yet. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. He's talking to believers now, and he said, this is what he says. You has he quickened. I never, I, there was a movie called The Quick and the Dead. I don't know, it's a Western. That's an old King James version. The word quick means alive. So whenever the, the title of that movie meant the alive and the dead, but the quick and the dead. But there was a little play on words, I guess, because if you were quick with your gun, right? Quickened. You has he quickened. In other words, you he's made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. You were dead when you were born of Adam, but he made you alive when you got saved. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, and you used to walk according to the course of this world. You used to be a son of anarchy, and you were walking according to the course of the world. You were going in the direction that everybody else was going in. You were living a sinful life like everybody else was living. According to the prince of the power of the air. Now, what the Bible's saying right there is, is that when you were walking that course of darkness with everybody else, you were being driven by a spirit. Amen. That's what it said. You might not like it, but you were being driven by a spirit. You were being by, driven by the prince of the power of the air. It's another way to say Satan. His spirit that rules upon this earth that draws people away from God. He says, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. There's people that are walking in disobedience to God. And they're under the influence of this spirit, the prince of the power of the air. Among whom also we all had our conversation. The word conversation means lifestyle. Old King James for lifestyle. What is that saying? You used to be that way too. Don't forget where you came from. Don't start getting all judgmental and looking down people at your, through your religious eyes and down your religious nose. Don't forget that you also used to be, oh, but my sin didn't look like their sin. I didn't used to smoke meth or crack or whatever. Okay, well, good for you. But guess what? You had your sin. You had something you weren't supposed to do. You had something that was going on, whether even if it was in your head, you weren't supposed to be doing it. And you were contrary to the ways of God. You were disobedient to the things of God. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Only Jesus can make those that are dead in sin resurrect to new life. 
He said that in John, for sake of time, we're not going to turn there. But in John 5, 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What is the point I'm trying to make? The first four verses that we read talked about the fact that through conversion, God changes us and equips us. Before we were saved, we were dead in sin. And until you're converted, you have not received the righteousness of God and you remain dead in your sin. Look at John eleven forty four. Not only are you alive from the dead, but God, we've been talking about it, He wants to equip you. Now, this is a beautiful story. I've preached this message probably twice at least since we started the church on Lazarus. Y'all know the story of Lazarus? He's the guy that died and Jesus told him to come forth out of the tomb. I love that story. This is my favorite verse in that whole story. Because, you know, Jesus is about to go to the cross. I realized this after I'd been a Christian for about 10 years. This whole miracle has to do with Jesus preparing the world for the fact that he's about to die and resurrect from the dead. But not only that, it's representative of the sinner that's born of Adam and receiving his new life in Christ. Look at this in John eleven forty four. 44. He that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus says unto them, Loose him and let him go. We see him that was dead come forth. But whenever you got to, we got to see this. Whenever him that was dead was resurrected to, a, to life, look how the grave tries to cling to him. The grave clothes try, try to hold him back. He's over there walking like a mummy. He can't even hardly move. He's over there shuffling around and he's got a napkin over his face. He can't even see where he's going. He's tripping all over the place. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. The napkin represents the blindness of sin and how it prevents us from being able to see the things of God. And the grave clothes represent the fact that sin will paralyze you and prevent you from being able to move forward in the things of God. But like in the first verses that we've already discussed, God sent his son Jesus, hallelujah, to deliver us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin, amen. And he's equipped us with the power of God in order to move forward in the things of God. That's good news. That's good. Loose him and let him go. Let him go, Satan. Whatever anybody in this room might be dealing with, the Lord says, loose him and let him go. Amen. Hallelujah. And bind those grave clothes. Remove that napkin so that he might see. Praise God. That he might see the things of God. Amen. Praise God. And so that was the first four verses. Now in these last couple of verses, we got seven minutes to finish up the message. And starting in verse five, things change a little bit. It goes from the fact that God changed you and equipped you to the fact that you got to cooperate with God. Amen. The Christian is equipped by God, but now he has to cooperate with God. You have to purposefully desire to see these things in your life. What are you trying to say? I got to work for them? Well, not exactly, but just as the branch is part of the vine, that's what Jesus said. I'm the vine, you're the branch. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The branch is part of the vine, and the fruit is part of the branch. And I understand something the fruit belongs to the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's the Holy Spirit. But guess what? The believer has to cooperate with God. God in order for the fruit to be produced. In verses 5 to 7, we have a responsibility. That's what he said. He says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now, I don't want you to think that it's as simple as, oh, I'm just going to add this and I'm going to add that. And I don't mean to get too technical, but the word in the, in the Greek was actually this right here. I thought this was interesting. I like learning stuff. I hope you do too. I might be putting you to sleep. I don't know. Corrige. It comes from it comes from the concept of the Greek tragedies. If you know what a Greek tragedy is, they used to have dramas back in the day in the ancient times in like 500, 600 BC, and they would have these traveling tragedies around. And so, what would end up happening is is that they would find a corrige who was a financial backer of the drama. They would say, hey. We need your finances to help back this drama. So he would financially supply. He would give aid to. 
The idea is, is that the Christian now is giving aid to the Holy Spirit. He's helping God in the endeavor of certain fruit being manifest in his life. The point being is that the divine nature is the one that's on the inside of us and is doing the work in us. But if the Christian doesn't want to cooperate with God and allowing these things to be produced, they're never going to be produced. You have to be, be on board with the Lord. You have to cooperate with him. You have a responsibility, amen, to allow God to do the work on the inside of your life. First thing that he said was add to your faith. Virtue. Virtue means excellence according to its intrinsic value. That's some big word. Huh? What does intrinsic mean? Y'all know what that means? It describes something that's on the inside of something. It's its, it's, it's inherent nature. What it is. You know? It's kind of like a field. Virtue is something excellent according to its intrinsic value. The idea is that it fulfills its purpose. Does that make sense? It fulfills its purpose. A field that produces a harvest is a virtuous, excellent field. Why? It produced its purpose. It did what it was supposed to do. I thought of Robert when I said this one. A saw that cuts a straight line is a virtuous, excellent saw. It fulfilled its purpose. It was created to cut a straight line and it did what it's supposed to do. And a Christian that glorifies God with his life is a virtuous, excellent Christian. Why? Because who he is on the inside now, he has the divine nature in him. God lives in him. And whenever his life produces godliness on the outside and it draws others to the Lord, he now is seen as God as virtuous. He's excellent. Why? Because he's performing and producing what it is that he was supposed to do. And to your virtue, you're supposed to add knowledge. Look, I want you to look real quick at Romans 11, 33. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You, you know, God's knowledge, God's revelation, God's wisdom. Is so beyond our comprehension, so beyond our understanding. It's almost like he's saying in this passage, you can't even really find it all out. But the good news is, is that each and every day we get an opportunity to search it out, to learn a little bit more about the things of God. You know, and once again, this is not just an intellectual form of knowledge. This is where we get to live life. Amen. We live life on a daily basis. And once again, we experience those things. And along with the knowledge of God, we begin to grow in our understanding of God. We get to learn. But see, what we're doing now is, is that we're working with God. We're cooperating with God. What I mean by that is Wednesday, we talked a little bit about forgiveness. Right? We talked a little bit about forgiveness and the fact that, you know, God, the Bible says God is love. And the manifestation of God's love was that he sent his son to die so that we could be forgiven. But if the Christian is unwilling to cooperate with God, he never gains the knowledge of the love of God. He never gains the knowledge of the forgiveness of God. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say is you can come to church every Sunday. You can even crack open your Bible and you can read it. And you can teach the children. But if you don't cooperate with God when it comes to forgiveness, guess what? You're not going to add the knowledge of God, the love of God. You're not going to be adding these things to your life because you're refusing to cooperate with God and to forgive like God forgave you. You're refusing to love. You, you understand that you still got to do that? Do you understand that when somebody does you wrong and treats you wrong, you still got to be willing to forgive and love. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Whether you want to be around them or not, you you got to be willing to forgive. Right. Temperance. It says we're back at we're back at Second Peter. This is another thing that we're supposed to add: temperance, which is self-control. 
The, word, the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. You know, the spirit that rules this world will never try to throttle the passions of sexuality. It just won't. The spirit that rules this world wants to get as much sex and passion as it can from whoever it can get it from. I know everybody's built a little bit different, but, but most people that have been in the world that had a sexual appetite, they know what I'm talking about. I'm just telling you, this is what this word has to do with. It has to do with sexuality. The kingdom of God is different, though. In the kingdom of God, God has prepared a specific place for sexuality to take place. And outside of the confines of marriage, sensuality and sexuality are not of the Lord. The problem is, is that if as a believer you feed that sexual, sensual appetite on something that you're not supposed to feed it on, it just causes the hunger to get even more. The next thing you know, the more you feed a sensual, sexual appetite, the more you want of that sensual, sexual appetite. The Christian has to work with the Lord and cooperate with God and not feed himself, not feed his flesh, because if he does that, he's going in the opposite direction. Amen. Amen? So if you find yourself exposing yourself to something that's causing your sexual appetite to go in the wrong direction, you need to cut it off. You need to move away from it. Amen? Yeah. Don't allow it to continue to cause you to become hungry for those things that because you're becoming nearsighted. It's like, here's the here and now. This is what I want right now. And you're becoming nearsighted. You're unable to see the far off promises of God that have been given to the Christian. Patience. Is the next one. And to patience is the next one. It says, th this word patience, I love this word. I know I've taught it many times, but this word is, is hupomone in the Greek. I hope I don't bore you with this. <laughs> I keep saying that. I guess I don't really care if I bore you because I keep doing it. <laughs> hupomone. This word means remain. And this word here means under. Remain under. The problem that we have is that even in Christianity, listen, not just Christianity, but even in Christianity, we just want to quit. We don't want to remain under. The word patience is another way to say perseverance. I can remember when I was a little kid, a little fat kid playing football, and we'd be in the middle of football practice and we had to do six inches. We'd have to lay on our back and lift our feet up six inches. I hated six inches. I hated it with a passion. Oh, I just wanted to quit. I wanted to let I was, I was some fat little chubby kid who was so to keep my little chubby legs up. And I just wanted, I don't want to do this. I want to hit somebody. And I, you had to wait for the coach to blow the whistle before you could lower your legs. I wanted to quit. And the problem is, is that we always want to quit. When the friendship isn't going right, we want to quit. When the marriage isn't going right, we want to quit. Right? When the boss says something to me that I don't like, I want to quit. When people treat me at work or they talk behind my back, I want to quit. I want to get away from that. When the preacher says something I don't like, I want to quit. Or when he does something I don't like, I want to quit. Problem is that Jesus didn't quit. Amen. Amen. When they blindfolded him, he didn't quit. When they slapped him in the face, he didn't quit. When they ripped the whiskers out of his face, he didn't quit. When they thrust the crown of thorns on his head, they didn't quit. When they clowned him. You remember that? They, 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 they clowned him, right? They blindfolded him. They put, they spit in his face. Have you ever been spit in the face? I had that one time I was on Bourbon Street with uh, Lance Rao. We were preaching the gospel. And this one dude spit in Lance's face. And then the next thing you know, I was thinking to myself, boy, look, somebody spit in my face. I don't know how that's going to go down out here. And the next thing you know, some dude walks up to me when I'm not looking. And he slaps me in the face and he runs over here. And he's like, yeah, you know, you stupid Christian. And I thought to my, and you know what I said? He said, what, what's it like to be, I don't remember what he said. I don't remember what I told him. But anyway, I was frustrated. But you know, by the grace of God, I didn't act like a fool. I, why did I even say that? I don't really know. I just know that I didn't like getting slapped in the face. And here's Jesus blindfolded and getting spit and slapped in the face. But he didn't quit. He didn't quit when he was carrying the cross up the hill. My point is, is that we're talking about remaining under the trial in a God-honoring way. Perseverance and hupomone is when I don't quit because if I quit in this instance, it's going to dishonor God. There's times that you can quit when God gives you the release to quit. 
right? God didn't want his children always getting beat up and pounded. There's times that the Lord would release you. Amen. But the truth of the matter is, is this, is that, is that God desires, amen, for us to remain under the tribe. Amen. The next thing that we need to be aware of is godliness. The word godliness means reverence or respect or piety towards God. Piety is a word that we don't use too much anymore. It, basically, it means to have respect for God. You know, you may treat me a specific way, and because of that, I may want to respond to you a certain way. But it's not just myself that I answer to, it's God that I answer to. And so therefore, out of respect for God or reverence for God, piety towards God, I respond a different way. I may have a boss that I answer to, but if my boss asks me to do something that is disrespectful towards God, we have a problem now. That's, that's because that's a lack of godliness. The, I answer to the Lord, I answer to his word and what he's taught me through his word. When I behave and live my life in such a fashion that it, that it correlates with the word of God, then I'm living my life in a godly manner. Now, the first five attributes, Shep's like, dude, you need to hustle this up, brother. You preaching, Shep? Preach it, brother. That's right. The first five attributes were between the believer and God, right? But now, there, but it's not just between the believer and God, because sooner or later, whenever God gets on the inside of you, it's also going to affect the people around you. It's going to affect your relationships around you. So the next thing is brotherly kindness. The word is Philadelphia. That's where the city of Philadelphia, the, the, the city of brotherly love. You know, some people might say, yeah, but I don't even like people. I like my mama and that's it. <laughs> well, but the problem is, is this. God loves people. God loves people so much he sent his son Jesus to die for them. Amen. So at some point in time, if the love of God lives on the inside of you, then you're supposed to also have love for human beings. At least love their soul. Amen. And desire to see them come into the kingdom. Next to brotherly love is charity. The word in the Greek is agape and it means the God kind of love. It has the word benevolence connected to it, which describes a gift or charity giving something to someone. In other words, the God kind of love is giving. It's not selfish. Many times, our love is built upon, what am I going to get out of this deal? Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Even people that got the best intentions and love other folk, they like, what's in it for me? Even if you don't say it like that, you got it going on in your head. What am I going to get out of this deal? You going to keep treating me like this? And I, I don't think so. God's kind of love is selfless. He gave Jesus whether you accept Jesus or not. He gave Jesus to die for your sin, whether or not you shake your fist in the face of God, whether you spit towards God, whether you, like Marilyn Manson in concert, take a Bible and rip all the pages out and throw it into the crowd. It does, God still sent Jesus to die for Marilyn Manson. Amen. It's his fault if he refuses to accept Jesus. That's right. If he goes to hell and he says, how can you serve a God that sends people to hell? I've had people tell me, God ain't sending nobody to hell. Time out. God is not sending anyone to hell. God sent his son. God sent a lamb to die for the sins of man. If a person wakes up and finds himself in hell, it won't because God sent them there. It will be because they refused and rejected the gospel message. God sent them a lifeboat, but they refused to believe it. That's charity. That's the love of God. Amen. And we're just going to close with verses 8 and 9. It says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and is forgotten that he was purged. From his old sins. He's focused so much on the here and now. He's focused so much on the surroundings. And the lust of the world is getting a hold of him. And he's become blinded to the big picture of God. Because whenever we truly have allowed God to come into our hearts. Guess what? We also see these things added into our lives.